I am unashamed. What about you? We read the text. These are 2,000 year old writings right at it. All of it was wrapped up from 33 AD and Jesus was here. The remainder of his life before he died was buried and raised from the dead, stayed 40 days and left. I, I would just think it's written long ago. These 2,000 year old writings. But what's interesting about it is how does that still apply? Does it still apply? So we read. So when we're, you know, like with the book, these books we come out with, we're like, yeah, we, we wrote a book and we quoted Bible verses written to the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire is no more. Right. It's gone. It's collapsed. Yep. Out of there. I said, this was a, when Jesus was here, there were good times in Rome. Times of peace. Not that they weren't really too much in the wars at that time. And old Augustus and Tiberius were the two that Jesus operated under. But it was a great time to be a Roman. Yep. Since that time, fast forward four, five, six hundred years, gone. Yep. So you can make it you could make a point to where this one is here. We're reading the text written to the Roman Empire, and evidently they didn't listen too well. <laughs> you think? <laughs> they didn't apply these scriptures. So 2,000 years later, we're applying them to these United States of America. What were they, What's their response going to be? Right. We don't believe it. We, you know, Jesus, who is that? I mean, you know, hate your neighbor. Right. Well, it sort of goes back to your the movie you did, The Torchbearer, mm -hmm. because the the Romans, exactly <clears throat> they were the God. last of the sort of ancient empires. But, you know, after them, you had the Brits, you know, pretty much. And we copy a lot of the things that Rome did. Right. You know. And then it was us. I mean, you're right. America has kind of been the lone superpower for a while. Yep. But I mean, look how rotten you know a lot of our culture is. So you're right. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't? How much has changed? Not much has changed yeah. in two thousand years. That's exactly nope. right. A human being would live their lives based on two thousand year old writings, just just on the face of it. Right. Let's see. Let's dig up something two thousand years ago, and let's be all in on that. That's a really good point, Dad. Because I can't remember. I mean, there's a handful of books that I go back to and look at from yeah. just like 20 or 30 or 40 years, not many. I mean, I've read a lot of books in my life, but there's not many that I would go back to. The Bible is so unique in that. I mean, you just think about it. What book do you say, you know, I, I'm going to go back to, you know, what, something, a fable book or, you know, I mean, it's just like there's, there's no book like it. To center your life around 2,000-year-old writings is uh, – you, you would have to be reading about the pitfalls, uh, and it's all covered. Atheism is covered. Gnosticism is covered. Mm -hmm. Socialism is covered. It's all covered. Right. You're like, and, and how do you interact with your fellow man? That's, right. that's plenty of that in there, then and now. Right. You say, it's as relevant today as it was when it was written. That's right. Pretty amazing. But if you took just the principles out of it, I think most people would agree. I mean, we're going to eventually get to 1 Corinthians 13. But if you thought, what if we lived in a world that was patient and kind and didn't envy and didn't boast and it wasn't rude and it wasn't self-seeking and it didn't get mad just at the drop of a hat. It kept no record of wrongs, didn't delight in evil. It always protected and trust. Yeah, uh, where where where'd you read that? Where'd you get that info from? Yeah. You like, but just think about thousand, it. A couple you, thousand years ago, if, you're like, if you what? didn't if you didn't know that was in the Bible, and you said, "Look, I have a map for society," even you could either use that or even the one that Jesus. I mean, you just think about when he started off in that Matthew five and that Sermon of the Mount. I mean, to me, it's like okay, it's one thing to claim your God in a man form and as as crazy as that sounds you came from a virgin 
I mean, without even, and your, your cousin, who looked like Mountain Man, <laughs> is the forerunner to this great prophecy of the kingdom of God. And so all of a sudden, these people gather up, and this is like the first public dissertation on the God of the universe coming from a guy in man form. And what he, would he say? What would he say? Out of all things that you could come up with, he comes up to his qualities that everyone should agree are underrated on being a functional, peace-loving human being. He's like, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the pure in heart, the peacemaker, and those who are persecuted because of righteousness. I mean, that, that was his opening and listen, line. <laughs> and he just interjected a few little thoughts you might think about from time to time, just in case you're willing to learn. Uh, you've heard that it was said, so someone was running around and they had a doctrine they lived by. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's a, that's a teaching that everyone should learn. But I tell you, uh-oh, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Love your enemies. Pray for the ones who are, are trying to kill you. You're like, did he ever change his mind all the way to death? No. His final words, uh, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Uh he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, <clears throat> what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? <clears throat> you say, ha. And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore as your heavenly father is perfect. And he ends that up on into chapter six of Matthew. If you forgive me and when they sin against you, your heavenly father would also forgive you. But if you do not forgive when they sin, when they sin against you, your father will not forgive your sins. So just remember, be real forgiving toward your neighbor while you're there. And even love your enemies. Don't hate anyone. Hey, I actually. It I, just seems kind of a strange teaching, mm -hmm. and but but you see people and boy to have put that into practice. It's it's actually it's tough the, one. I evidently. I was actually the recipient of some love this weekend from my neighbors. Good who, for you because I, I was the recipient of some hate. Oh well, all right. I'll tell you this story. Right, I want to hear this. You got to remember. You got to remember that. Uh, <laughs> When you're doing, this thing cuts both ways, Jace. When you're doing a TV show, you're, there's a lot going on. And I guess you throw in the podcasts and events and just life, you know, just the pace of life is, is fast. We're in a fast pace right so now. So I had pulled in from a week of shooting this show. Of course, I got everything important from a material possession point of view in my truck. Because I'm, you know, the way we're doing this show, if we want a fire, you know, I got to build one. So I got, you know, I got everything from grills to charcoal to wood in the back of my truck. If I want to eat, I got an ice chest full of stuff. And I mean, I got my fishing film, pole. You're filming this in the middle of nowhere every time. Middle of nowhere every time. You don't know what you're going to get into. So I just bring everything. Guns, Rod and reels, baits, things for fire. <laughs> it sounds like bags. a survival expedition. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> so I have my truck literally cannot hold another thing. And so when I got home, I was cleaning out some stuff and some stuff I'm keeping. It's a transitional period. And so, uh, well, the next morning, Sunday morning. Is the I'm film going, crew partaking of your survival uh survivability the film crew are, are they invited for whatever would you get a little snack because you hadn't eaten anything 
Oh, oh yeah, listen. And maybe get get warm their butt around <laughs> the fire. I mean, well, I'm sure. Oh, well, I'm listen. sure Jap is just as prepared as Jay, so because you know he speaks of survivalism. What is that, a Jap? <laughs> so, uh, well, so you got like, L.A. and law. La- <laughs> that was sarcasm, la- Jay. <laughs> they, these people are coming out of Los Angeles, California, and probably New York City. And yet they're gathered up in the middle of nowhere down in deep Louisiana. I mean, uh, I know one thing. I cooked some uh, hot sausage on my little grill that I used. There you go. Duck blind and one of those. Was ca- that for everyone? Or? Well, one of those cameramen, he, he said, what does that taste like? I took that to mean. <laughs> I'm hungry. Yeah. It was like, it was like, Doc Holliday, what's it like to wear one of those? Yeah. I mean, and so, he was uh, wanting some of that sausage. I was putting the buns on the, on the grill. I had these onion buns and I had that hot jalapeno cheese sausage. So I slapped him one together. And uh, so he got, he just fixed to take a bite. I was like, you might ought to have you some water handy if you're not used to it. And he's like, no, I'm good. He took one bite and he said, yep, let me go get this <laughs> I could just see by the way his eyes were and the smoke started coming out of his ears. Yeah. No, I mean, I can tell he thought, wow. <laughs> but then the next day when I saw him, I said, how what? Did everything, how was that? He's like, it's one of the greatest things I've ever eaten. Once oh, yeah. I got over the shock. Of the heat, yeah, like, yeah, it lingers. <laughs> anyway, what I but say, but plus, Jay, it's, it's the it's the old deal about when you're cold and in out in nature and you eat uh, a hot meal. It is. It I'm, is. It is like it's well, ten times better than that would have been just at better. your house. I could have taken some vinyl sausage, put right. it on that little grill, and you eat it, and you're like, you know, it's not bad. That's right. <laughs> but so so I'm leaving. I get up next morning, and uh, I'm gonna go meet with the brothers before I'm going to scout where we're going to be this week. I mean, I was, here we go again, but I was like, I just, there's something about being with, with other believers singing to the Lord. I was like, I'm, I'm going to be in that yep. crowd. And I, I told Missy I'm with you, but I'm going to, then I'll listen to the sermon I'll just put it on my phone as I'm traveling to my next destination. I was like, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna sing with the brothers and I did. Boy, it was just it was awesome. But so I'm so excited that I'm going to do this. I mean, literally I'm like, I, I need to just spend some time with the brothers and sisters singing a powerful way. Well, I never even looked at my truck. I just got in it and took off. And what I didn't realize is I had my ice chest. Uh, I got one of those Yeti ice chests with the wheels on it, but I had emptied it out and just left it on the tailgate sideways, not where it would roll, but it, I didn't, the tailgate wasn't closed. I have all this other stuff, but it's just sitting there. Well, I didn't know that. I just got my truck and took off because I'm preoccupied in my mind. (laughs) Well, people are waving and blowing the horn at me and I'm hey you know what's going on well, everybody's friendly today well people were trying to say you have an ice chest on the back of your truck that how I made it about three miles three miles so well, yeah these are pretty well made yeah, well they are they're, yeah, heavy, they're heavy but still you're turning curves and so finally the dam broke because I hear <laughs> and I look back and there's cars going hitting the ditch and I, and I see this ice chest just end over end down the highway and I thought whoops and here's where the love part came in one everyone was trying to tell me on the way there's a problem but I was completely oblivious I just thought well everybody's being friendly hang on let's take a break So uh, we talk about um, Helix mattresses, Jay's, how much we enjoy them. The company uh, that makes those mattresses uh, makes a couch, and it's, uh, it's called Allform, A-L-L-F-O-R-M. Very comfortable. They're customized. So Lisa and I went online, you know, because I don't really pick stuff like that out, but she does. And so she, you get to pick the, the color. You get to pick, you know, all the different things about it, the color of the legs, the sofa size. They make them up to an eight-seat sectional. Uh, we have one at the house. We love it. Really good product. Uh, and so it's fast, free shipping. Um, it takes about three to seven days to arrive. You can assemble it yourself, which Lisa and I did. And I'm not very good at assembling stuff, but it was very easy. Uh, and if you're kind of worried, well, what about buying you know a couch without trying it? 
you don't need to worry. You get 100 days to decide if you want to keep it. That's more than three months. So you're going to love it. They will pick it up for free, give you a full refund if you don't like it. Uh, they've got their what they call their forever warranty, which I know Jace loves. Um, anytime you use <laughs> the word forever. Uh, but that's what they call it, their forever warranty. So go to allform.com slash unashamed. They're offering 20% off all orders from our listeners, for our unashamed listeners. Allform.com slash unashamed and get your great couch. But then the other thing is a guy gets out of his car and to my surprise, the ice chest is still functional. You know, he's rolling it up to me. I mean, he he's getting it out of the ditch. Now I'm feeling bad. That's a good advertisement for Yeti. Well, it was. <laughs> but so I'm like, I got it. But look, everybody, I mean, they're, well, I've stopped traffic. I mean, in every direction. But I looked around and everybody was just like, Nobody was hollering obscenities. Get off the road, you idiot. Well, I was saying, I'm an idiot. <laughs> I'm stupid. I'm an idiot. Confess your sins. Confess them. Yeah, I was, because I was like. So you, so you worship, now you're confessing your sins to confess, the old. Confessing my sins. And so then I got, got there, and I, was, I told Miss, I was like, you're not going to believe what I just did. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying, I've. I just felt that was nice of that guy to do it. And I was like, man, I'm so sorry. I mean, what could have caused a wreck? I was like, he's like, you know, no problem. I'm glad to help. I mean, he was just really Well, nice. if all this happened while you were doing a TV show, I could see that uh, you wouldn't be altogether functional with the with the grind of it all. And you sort of. It is a grind. Yeah, well, you know how it is. You know, we, you get, we, we've you been get, there. So well, you, you get distracted, you know, because right. your mind's on a million things and you're not thinking about the practical things of life. Right. Like, don't be driving around with your tailgate. Being though. a danger to society here, you <laughs> idiot. <laughs> I mean, can oh, you imagine man. if a cop would have seen that? I oh. probably, he'd probably taken me to jail. I mean, it's so funny that you were talking about that because we went to Illinois last week and I was now. You used to, I used to have a five hour window. If I can get there in five hours, I'd drive it just because it doesn't make a lot of sense to fly because you got to go hub and some and fly in. Well, now that my zone has expanded to eight hours just because it's so intolerable on an airplane now with these stupid masks. I can't breathe when I get there. It's just miserable. So Lisa asked me how far it was. We were at a marriage retreat and I, and I looked it up on the computer. I had already looked it up and it was eight hours. But the second time I looked it up, like weeks later, and like you, I'd, I'm living life, forgetting stuff. And she was like, how long is it going to take us to get to Illinois? So I pulled it up on the computer where it said 12 hours. And I'm like, well, that ain't going to work. I mean, I can't drive 12 See, hours. I would have stopped and said, there's an 8 and 12. Maybe I got something wrong. That's here. what I should have done. Yeah. But like you, I'm distracted. I got a lot of stuff going on. So you got to get some plane tickets. We can't. I can't drive that. It's too far. We got to get back and do another thing. So she goes through the whole thing. We get the plane tickets. Well, then we get to, we fly, we get there, and th I still got to drive hours. It's just a nightmare scenario. And we get up there. I put it up on my phone. It's seven and a half hour drive. I've done all this stuff because I was an mm -hmm. idiot and didn't double check because the difference. I mean, we're talking about flights, rental cars. I mean, just, and I was saying the same thing. I said, what an idiot you are. I mean, like, why didn't you check yourself? <laughs> Nightmare, Shale. That was horrible. I mean, it was all my fault. Now you got to learn this one word. Whoops. Whoops. That's exactly what I said. So what's your, so that was the love story. What's the, uh, I'm curious, what was the, what were, how were you the, uh, the, uh, the. Uh, oh, it, all, all it takes is, it's real simple. Uh. I've never I've never clicked on <clears throat> to the internet, and I'm never on a cell phone, so I'm not. But, but if you have you, people who do. But if you put forth information that's godly, and you were on a lot of shows the last two weeks because of your a book. lot of shows, yeah. And if if, if when, when but somebody you, looked uh, up, somebody read you some comments, I guess. Yeah. But, well, you need to tell your. But amazingly, people, uh, Phil, uh, uh, quit reading you the comment. I haven't read a comment on stuff like well, that. Dan, Dan tells me stuff, and I said, "Well, yeah, that's yeah. okay, Dan." Well, just tell him, don't tell him, don't tell you. But Dan said, amazingly, he did say, he said, if you quote Bible verses all all week, 
uh, in America to various entities. If you just stick with, they ask a question, you quote a verse, they ask another question, you quote another verse, they ask another question. That's the way I roll. I well, just, I have to say that I listened to several of your interviews, and some of them now are more long form, you know, like podcasts and stuff. So you were on 20, 30 minutes on some of these shows, and you were extremely positive where other people I felt like were trying to, to go negative, you know, because that's yeah. kind of the world they live in. Yeah. And so, they, but dad didn't go. He I, did, he I did saw not it take, over and over. You did not take the bait. You, you were positive. You kept saying, you know, well, what about these people that hate you? And you said, I love them. You know, I want to, I mean, I felt like the, Jesus died for all. Right. So loved the world. That's right. Well, you know, in the world, you can expect a little flack from time to time. Right. Uh, all the apostles, but but John, I think, were slaughtered, were killed. Yeah. So they will get worse than they are now. Right. Now you just take a tongue lashing and yeah, yeah, yeah. They curse you out and you know call you bad names. But Jesus did but, say to love your enemies. That's right. Well, he yeah. did say to love your enemy. He did. I mean, that, say that, that that sounds great, but practically that's very <laughs> difficult it to is. do. It is. I found that out with the interviews. Yeah. Some of them were having a hard time. With they say you should be mad, and I said, "Oh no, I'm sad, right. not mad." Yeah, I thought you did really well. Dad. I was I was very impressed that you kept it. I mean, which is the concept of the book, but that's what you kept it there. The idea was I don't cancel people. What difference would it be between me if I jumped on somebody and canceled them for whatever reason? Right. Why don't I just love them and move on? Right. Well, and it was a it was an amazing thing that your book release called Uncancelled the week that. Joe Rogan and Whoopi Goldberg. There was all these huge, you know, controversy swirling around about canceling people. And you had a message of, you know what, boys? I, I, and I, my sins have been canceled. I love people. Yeah, I mean, it was just, it was a really positive. Dan walked was over really with good. his cell phone. He said, check that out. And I looked, and it was Rogan, me, and Whoopi Goldberg on the other side. And we're, we, we're all, all of us. <laughs> I was thinking, <laughs> how did I get into that particular place? Dan's bunch? looking, he's doing way <laughs> too much Googling. <laughs> well, uh, unlike Dad's is the extreme of never looking at anything. Dan, he's very fluent in the Internet. He knows. Well, we know. talked yeah. about it uh, this morning. Missy came out with a book. Are we? Is she going to be on here? Yeah, she's going to be on, I think, next week. I actually read it. It was really good. It's a children's book. But it's she partnered with uh, this I guess that's the company's name. I'll probably get this all wrong. But, yeah, I think it's Brave Books, and I'm and they were asking us questions about it, and I thought, what we're living in a world now where you're considered brave if you're promoting family <laughs> activities. That's right. <laughs> that's Just how upside basic down. That's right. family activities, right. and they're like, look. We're going to show some bravery here and some courage, and we're actually going to do a family book and promote this as something we need to do in our families. Yeah. Woo, that's a brave move. You know, look down. What a brave person. <laughs> I, there's a picture, and I'm in between two individuals that I know very little about. I, I don't know that much about them, and I'm like, yeah. I, but my picture's with them, and I'm like, well, what's that all about, Dan? He said, it's a, it's a long story. He said, <laughs> yeah, I'd like to, I actually would have liked to read that story. Yeah. She, I think it was, I think it was on foxnews.com. And cause dad had said something in an interview about, you know, Hey, I don't, I'm not into canceling people. So they, they quoted something dad said about that, those controversies. That's what oh, it was. Okay. But it was, it was interesting cause we met Whoopi Goldberg when y'all did the view and I was with y'all and she was real friendly. I vaguely her. remember that. She was very nice. I mean, it was just a pass by in the hall. She didn't do the interview. But I thought she was nice to us. She did, she wasn't, you know, she, she didn't say anything ugly. So, of course, she never met Joy Behar. That might have been something else. Yeah, but, Al, you don't know people till you meet them. That's dude. true. I mean, you got to remember the media out there. They're notoriously known for, you know, exaggerating whether something, you know, they're positives or they're negatives. And then you meet people, and you're like, oh, well, I read on the Internet. Well, see, that's the danger of that. Well, see, and Barbara Walters was still on there when, when y'all were on. And uh, what was funny was Dad was so great with her because she kind of came in, and she was a little – it was she was playful, but she was kind of, you know, letting us know, you know, we're in, y'all are in a different world than I am. And Dad's like, I'm going to get you on this duck, blowing this duck call there, 
Barbara Babs or whatever you call her. <laughs> and she said, I'll never blow that call. Well, then they get out there in the interview and they said, here, give us a try there. When well, the crowd starts into it. So then she blows the call. And I thought it was really funny because she was like, I'll never blow that duck call with that. But, but the first she did. Duck call she's ever blown like <laughs> That's that. right. It was. <clears throat> but I mean, so we had the green room talk, but then on the air, you know, it was, it was playful. It was kind of, like, it reminded me of the, some of the interviews you've done in the past. Mm-hmm. So. But I think it's, it's kind of responding the way you want to respond. I mean, it's kind of interesting, the love and hate we're talking about. You know, you want to be a loving response to other people. Exactly. Instead of the other. Let's take another break. So we, I travel a lot, so I wind up in a lot of different hotels. My last stop was a, I was in a cabin. And so, you know, when you're in a cabin at a camp, you know, you, you pretty much know, you know, from our perspective, it's a little bit more rough in it. But I, what I miss the most on trips like that is my sheets from back home because we only use bowl and branch sheets and have even before they were sponsors of this podcast because it's a really quality product. Um, all their cotton, everything is soft. It's cool. That's all the things that I like when I'm trying to sleep at night. Uh, I think you'll like these guys too if you check them out. They've got 100% organic cotton, uh, thoughtful, every detail. They have the deep fitted sheets so they're not popping off the corners of the bed, which a lot of cheap sheets will do. Uh, 30-day risk-free trial and free shipping and returns, but you won't want to return it. Go to Bowl and Branch, B-O-L-L and Branch.com. Use the promo code Robertson at checkout. You're going to get 15% off your first set of sheets. That's BowlandBranch.com, promo code Robertson, 15% off, and enjoy the sheets. So we're... Uh, we left off that in First Corinthians 10 while you were doing all your your media. We had the women yep. on, which Jace, uh, Lisa and I did. You know, we had uh, Rachel and Sean Duffy. Yeah, on the they, were, they were good. They were amazing. So this morning, before I came down here, Lisa and I were on their podcast, which was really neat. So, oh. yeah. I, well, I, so I didn't get invited. They must have well, I think they're going to invite you and Missy on no. another one. So, yeah. No, I was just kidding. Yeah. I really liked that couple. Yeah, they were good. Well, I was doing Missy's book thing this morning. So. Yeah. And I think that's fixed to come out as well. Yeah, I think I think it releases maybe next week or some. She's going to be on a, on the our podcast, I think. When well, it let's releases. just let her tell us about it, so I don't screw that. <laughs> well, you know, I know you will. Yeah. Uh, so we're in. Uh, so we left off at First Corinthians ten. Um, oh, but before we get there, I wanted to read this because Dad, you were talking about the the relativity of the Bible across all culture. And it made me think of this verse because I shared it last week. When I was in Illinois, on the last podcast, Jay's, I kind of bounced my idea off of you. So I met with these leaders in little small churches all across southern Illinois. And I was really impressed. These people are just salt of the earth. I mean, truck truck drivers, the, the people that came to the men's event, they were uh, farmers, just good old boys, you know. And uh, when I spoke that night, it was 1,500 men there. And the biggest crowd that I ever had was 400. And it wasn't just because I was there, but it was because they've been locked down so long because they're in Illinois. And so I told them when I got up there, I was like, how many of y'all listen to Unashamed? And I'd say probably half of the guys in there raised their hand. And 1,500 people is a lot of people. And uh, I said, well, I'm going to go back home and tell Jason Dad that I parachuted into a blue state behind enemy lines, and I found a bunch of rednecks. In Miami, they went to hooping and hollering. It was like, this is our kind of people. But but I shared this verse with them, because I think it goes to what you were saying, Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of to him who we will give an account. Which would, might be, which would feed into the point that whether it be my old Satan uh, or Joseph Stalin or Adolf Hitler, all these types yep. said the first thing you do if you want control of people is you get rid of the Bible. Right. Get rid. Don't leave any. Burn them all. Yep. Pretty amazing. Right. These these isms that rise up, you know, 
socialism, communism. But the first thing they say, get rid of, is the Bible and the people who carry them. Yep. Get rid of them. But, you know, even even to a certain... Pretty amazing 2,000-year-old writings. We've seen some of these leaders rise up and just absolute carnage and just slaughter people. You say, yep. Get rid of the Bible, and, and you're you're free to free to get it then. Right, it's amazing. But even to a certain degree in our culture, because you, you can't talk about God in school, you can't pray, you can't you can't read we're your Bible. We're on our way. Yeah, I mean, we're in the early steps. Yeah, of the let's things. go the Stalin route. You know, the Hitler route. Let's go in my old Satan, all this Cambodia, that guy, Pol Pot or whatever his name was. Yep. You're like slaughtered people, just slaughtered them. Yeah. And that's the wavelength they want us. That's that's what they want us to embrace. Yeah, that's not good. And but but this I, I like that idea that it's living and active, meaning that it's always going to be relevant. And it's because you have to have some absolute line in your life. And these tyrants know that. That's right. And that's well, they want you to depend on them. That's why, you know, it's led by it's satanic. That's right. It's against God's word. Um, so Jason, I talked about uh, First Corinthians nine. Um, before we were talking about how it's just kind of an illustration of Paul saying, you know, because we were talking about food sacrifice to idols, that you can give up your rights, you know, that you have to help someone else. So it's kind of that idea about what we were just talking about, about that loving response to people. But then he, he kind of shifts when he gets to chapter 10. He's still talking about idolatry. But to me, it's almost kind of like he kind of shifts into this thing to kind of say, but look, we're talking about things that don't matter, you know, whether a meat was sacrificed to an idol or it doesn't. I mean, well, I think I think too they were looking at it like making a big deal over what you eat, right? Instead of realizing that God is the ultimate provider, right? And in this case, He's if God is faithful, you have very little to worry about right. if you have your faith and trust in Him. I mean, I, I feel like. That's where he's going with this. I mean, because he ended First Corinthians nine saying, you know, it's like this competition. All the participants or they go through all this training and because the, what very, is it called the the isthmus games? The isthmus games. Yeah, they I mean, were this going to be difficult. This is going to be eventual. Well, life is difficult. Yeah, life is full of ups and downs and difficulty and pain and suffering and but you persevere and you keep you know and at the end you get a crown. That won't even last here in an earthly right. game, but for the will of God, you, you're getting the crown that'll last forever. So it's like then he made these illustrations. He launched in from there with Moses and the Egyptian uh, in the Egyptian world, and you, you you're the Old Testament history buff. Yeah, well, uh, it, it, which I find interesting, and I've said this before, Jay. It's, it's really in most of the people, most of his audience. Is a Gentile audience. I don't know most. I mean, obviously the church had both Jews and Gentiles who well, were converted. It was a port city. I mean, but you know there had to be a ton of Gentiles, so they're not going to yeah. know a lot of this Jewish history. But Paul, because he's a was was a Pharisee. I mean, when he illustrates, he's going to go back to his history, and so I think it's interesting because I think what he's saying in this first part is, look, idolatry is bad. Like. We're talking about sort of the, the things that it produces that may not matter one way or the other, but idolatry itself is bad. And he says, for I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact. So he's like saying, this is something you need to know. Yeah, but I think, Al, it's leading to this statement in 1013. I mean, we're, we're going to go through the examples. But when he, and this is one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. When he says, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. Because he's going to make this illustration of how difficult it was. Forty years wandering around in the wilderness, but the wilderness was actually their pathway to freedom. Right. That, that God was going to allow them to go through all this so they would rely on him. Just like modern day, all the things going on in Corinth, these difficult things that you endure. And then he makes this statement. But God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. I mean, I, I just think if you read the point right. Right. first and then go back, God is faithful. Yep. Which means everything to you. Right. I mean, that's why we write songs about that. He's the way. 
uh, what's that song? The uh, Promise Keeper. Oh yeah. Uh, oh. Um, the way promise keeper uh waymaker <laughs> waymaker that was the one i was looking for but that that's why that song's powerful because that's what he was trying to get you know put their focus on hey, let's take a break so dad you don't have a cell phone right is that nope, have we never owned a cell phone have we have we firmly established that on the podcast you're not a cell phone guy but because of your book release you spend a lot of time on the computer um this last couple of weeks, right? Talking to others. Talking to others, which was kind of nice because you didn't have to go to New York. I mean, Dan has a little bitty laptop looking thing. Right. He they, sets it all up, you know, but I wouldn't know where to even start. Right. So so dad's not going to be uh, the kind of guy that's going to need a cell phone coverage. But for the rest of us, uh, we need that. And so one of our sponsors is a company called Patriot Mobile. And, uh, you know, they're, they they say about themselves they're the only christian conservative cell phone provider you don't see that a lot out there in the world so great company uh they're really good at helping first responders and veterans as well so we'd like you to check them out uh see what they're offering patriotmobile.com slash phil or you can call 972 patriot you get free activation with the offer code phil so Support this company. They love America. And they love you. PatriotMobile.com slash Phil or call them at 972-PATRIOT. No, I agree. And so the the whole deal about Moses and the desert and the people was the idea that if you, you're right, Jay, if you trust in God, he, he, provided a way for them to come out of tyranny and slavery. Yeah. And it was a, it was an image of what was going to happen here in the first century, but it was, you know, the slavery of sin. So that's why he keeps using that illustration. What's amazing is while they were wandering around that desert at first, you know, they were just out there and trying to get away. But then after a while they wanted to go back. Yeah. And so the point gets made a lot of the New Testament is like, why would you want to go back? Like, the, the, they wanted their freedom. They were then they were free, but then it wasn't comfortable. The freedom is hard. It's hard. It's, that's exactly. But you're right. free. That's right. You would think they would figure it out, but they didn't. And, and it I'm got like, so bad. It got the, rated R. Yeah, it got so bad, which he's going to bring up some of these instances here Sounds in this text. like modern-day America if y'all keep talking. It does, and there's no doubt it does. But look, it got so bad that he said, okay, I'll tell you what. I'm so sick of listening to this. That So you're going to wander around out here until all the old heads, the, the ones who should be coming into this new land, you're all going to die. And you're not even going to get to see what, what I got for you. So what should have been a three- or four-year process – to get all those people across the desert wound up being 40 years and they all died out because they grumbled, they complained and they wouldn't let go of Egypt. And so I just found that fascinating that how that illustration then well, comes forward. And they were prideful and that's what happens. That's why you come up with idols and you want it, you know, I, idolatry. All it is, is where you're changing the true real living God for something that's not real to justify your position or right. your lifestyle or because of your pride. Right. That's that's what we do. And we, we do it in various ways even today. We don't call it idolatry, but we, I mean, I would say an example of that is just having, if your view of Christianity is something you do once a week for an hour, mm -hmm. well, you've changed the living God. You just read this. Right. Nothing is, nothing is, hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare. But people you see every day, they'll say, let's go meet the Lord and you'll meet him. Yep. And then you'll leave and you think he no longer sees you anymore, contrary to what Ephesians 4, 12 and 13 says. Right. So is that not idolatry? Yeah. There's no doubt it is. Yeah. So what's interesting, Jay, is he starts off, and Dad, you said this when we were <clears throat> studying John and Matthew, that you never... Uh, hear about or read about baptism until John the Baptist comes along. Yep. And he starts baptizing this baptism of repentance. Yep. But it's interesting because Paul is going to go back and use something as an illustration and he use, and he's using the new birth. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant that our forefathers were all under the cloud because there was a cloud that was going over them so they'd know which way to go. 
and that they all pass through the sea. And he means the Red Sea. So imagine there's this cloud that's over them. He parts the Red Sea. And so while they're walking through with wall of water on the right, wall of water on the left, and a cloud on top of them, it's like they're immersed. And he said, he says they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So he uses that illustration that this was a new birth for Israel. This is, in other well, words, and were, that they grew because it says they all ate the same spiritual food yep. and drank the same spiritual drink. Well, if you just stop right there, you'd say, well, what you are, what you eat and drink. So what should you be? You should be spiritual. You should be spiritual. But then, and, and, then and what like, he means is the, the food was coming from heaven, yep. manna, and the water was coming out of a rock that shouldn't yep. have been producing water. You know, and a couple of pages later, he just reminds them, we were all baptized by one spirit into one body where the Jews are Greek, slave or free. We're all given the same spirit. Spirit to drink. Right. He, he brings it up again. He does. So, so the point is, as he's going into it, it's a beautiful illustration that just like we experience a new birth and are cleansed in Christ and then receive spiritual food and spiritual nourishment, the hunger, at, you know what you said earlier, just hunger at and thirst for righteousness. We receive that from Christ. We should be spiritual. God's spirit leading the way. That's right. But they weren't. Because they kept wanting to go back under slavery, and yep. guess what? Well, because people do that today. Because it was difficult. Though. It was hard. But it's no different from when Jesus was baptized. Remember, I taught a lesson on this before, and we when we went through Matthew. But when Jesus was baptized, I mean, heaven is talking. God is declaring, "This is my Son, whom I love, in whom I'm well pleased." The Holy Spirit descends, and I mean, almost like. It's like you're seeing a movie, you know, it looked like a dove and Holy Spirit's descending on him. So now what? We're going to fix all the world's problems. No, nope. what happens? The Spirit carries him to the wilderness yeah. of all things right. for the most trying time of his of his ministry. So we did that thing from the water to the wilderness. And yeah. guess what? He's tempted and it's hard. And unlike us, Jesus actually made the right decisions. He started quoting scriptures, which is... A good, good thing to go by when you're in situations like that. Well, remember what he said, because Satan said, if you're really the son of God, turn these stones into bread. You got plenty to eat. I mean, you claim you're the son of God. Turn the, And then he said, what did he say? Man does not live <laughs> on bread alone. Well, right. So the uh, the idea was I tr- I choose to trust in God. And Which he is does the it same as about the meat for sacrificed idols. Exactly. It's not really about the meat. It's for the one who can provide this for you. Exactly. I mean, he's making it rain, man and quail. I mean, you'd think. That'd be enough for me as an outdoorsman. I'm like, boy, there's just nothing flying today. Oh, oh, wait. Here's some bread and quail coming from the heavens. And how good was that? You think that manna? What this was? I mean, God cooked this up. I ate it yesterday. Quail along with bread. Yeah. And they were delicious. (laughs) On Sunday. I I said, you need to produce some of these quail, Miss K, once a week. I said, These are good. She said, okay, I'll, I'll tell wherever she gets them from. Yeah. Said, I'll tell him, man. <laughs> so, well, yeah, the, the difference. Let's take another break. Well, to your point in 10.5, when he says, yeah, nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Oh, uh, I left out that second part of, of three, where right. it says, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ, which I love. Which is really interesting. That, that it's about God's presence in these situations. And, I mean, if you go back, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God which I believe in Genesis 1 when it says, the, you know, when you read the first yeah. chapter of Genesis 1, it says the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, and God said. So God the Father said. Well, whatever words, yep. I believe, was Jesus. but It, it was because when you read John 1, mm-hmm. the Word was with God, the Word was God. You know, and so there's been quite a bit. You may know the exact number of years, but it uh, was quite a stretch from Jesus who was with them. Quite a stretch from that time frame to 
to, to the Roman Empire. Right. You see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. But I love the idea that Jesus is representative of living water across all time. Yeah. So what's what you're talking about. From the, exactly. from the beginning to this time. Yep. I mean, he's been living water from the beginning. Yep. And here's a rock. The water's coming out of it. And they're like, huh. I mean, you would think, because people, you know, I'm telling you, people today, they're like, boy, if I could just see a miracle, you know, that'd change everything. Well, they're seeing all kinds of miracles. It's raining bread and quail. <laughs> you got a rock that's just water's just spewing out of it, you know. At what point are you, you're, are you saying, there's somebody really big and powerful who is for us, and, uh, and they're allowing this to happen? Maybe it's not so we can be miserable. Maybe it's because he has something better planned for us. There's yeah. some kind of reason, reasoning for this to be happening. It never entered their mind that the one with them, spiritual rock, uh, accompanied them. And that rock was Christ, but he's a long time before he becomes flesh. Right. And even when he became flesh, the naysayers... We're still there. Right. I mean, look what they did to him. Right. Yeah. So pretty hard hearts all the way from Moses all the way to when Jesus showed up. Right. I heard a, uh, I heard a sermon by Jeff Wally, I guarantee it's 20 years ago, but I, I never forgot it because he addressed 6 through 10 in a way I thought practically fast forward to modern day America. That was pretty clever. And I'll take you through it real quick as I read it. Because verse 6 says, These things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. And so his lesson was about these five things that happened that you can look at from the, the final one back to the first and see how you get away from God. So he's like, the first step is you have an idea. You set your heart on an evil thing. You just think about how does how does your life take a wrong turn? Well, it usually comes up with an idea. I want to do this. All right. Number two, do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. So if you're looking at this from a step, so number one, you have the idea. Number two, you come up with a way to excuse it, which is another way to define idolatry. So you have to have some reasoning because you know deep down it's wrong because God wrote it on your heart. So you have the idea and then you say, okay, the living true God is clear about this. So I'm going to go with this God version, which is idolatry. So now you excuse it. You have the idea. Now you have an excuse. Number three is you actually do it. Verse eight, we should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them did. So now you got the third phase. You had the idea, you rationalized it, and now you're doing it. So then what comes next? Verse 9, we should not test the Lord as some of them did, and and were killed by snakes. Because now you got to read between the lines. Why do they keep doing this? Because at first they're like, oh, we did it. And it's just like any sin that you do. You hear it's wrong. You know you shouldn't do it. But when you actually do it, what actually happens to you? Nothing. I mean, you may feel bad about it, but you weren't, you know, struck by lightning or in the moment. And so you get away with it. Well, then you start testing the Lord. So you start going to church on Sunday saying, yeah, I shouldn't have done that with the plan or making an appearance, you know, and then. So now you're just doing it right in the face of the Lord. And so the fifth step is then you grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. Now I'm going to tell you what I do practically on this formula. When I, all through my kids' lives, when I saw one of them having a bad attitude for no apparent reason, I, w- I went and confronted them and went backwards. Because I'm like, why are they, why are they? What's wrong? You know, Missy was being like, well, what is wrong with it? But they woke up there, terrible attitude. I was like, I know what it is. They had an idea of doing some cutting up, and they rationalized it. Then they started doing it, and now they're doing it right under our roof and the Lord's presence, and they got a bad attitude about it. <laughs> so let's let's start with the attitude and go backwards. <laughs> and there was never one time where that formula did not prove true. So, I mean, you say, what, 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 are you, what have you been doing? 
And they're like, oh, nothing. Yep, well, no, you're testing the Lord and you're trying to test me. Now you're lying about it. Yep. They're like, well, why, what did you hear? I was like, you got a crappy attitude. It's either a guilty conscience or you want us to confront it. You right. wanted my attention. You have a bad attitude for no reason. You wake up, you're mad at the world. You're mad at us. You hate us. You're grumpy. Your grades are not as good. All these things are happening. So finally you get to where the mischief has happened and, and the reasoning involved. I mean, that's just 101 parenting. It is. And it shows you how easy it is to create an idol. Huh. I mean, yeah. it could be a lot of different things and a lot of different things. You know, we talked about this before when we talked about idolatry. There's a lot of things that you can decide you're going to, you know, set your heart to. And if it's not God, it's, it's not going to end well. I would say, Jason, <clears throat> the, and that was an excellent five point lesson. The, the thread that goes through all of that was there were consequences Every, to every one of those steps that you mentioned, the, there were consequences, and they weren't good. Exactly. I mean, that's, well, that's what happened, both in time and end of time, but, but both are bad. So it starts at the first, though, about your heart, which is goes back to when we had uh, our brother from Oklahoma. Uh, Larry Bowles. Larry Bowles on. You know, he started off with that, what's going on in that heart, in your deep down motives that God sees? And so... In verse 12, he says, so if you think you're standing firm, I mean, he says in 11, these happen, these these were examples and warnings for us. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. And I think that's where it all starts. Set, set your heart on things above, not on earthly things, because that was the first place. What you put into your heart and the ideas that come from that and this pride that goes along with it. If you're like, oh, ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. You know, I'm, I got this all by myself. I can do this. Well, be careful so that you don't fall. And then when he says no temptation to seize you except what is common, man, God is faithful. So what, I was reading McGuigan's con commentary, and he had a version of something like this that basically said to the vulnerable, to the open-minded, to the thankful uh, to those those kind of qualities that we started off in Matthew 5, the poor in spirit, the meek, to those, there is a God. And if there's a God, there's a way. Yeah. I mean, he just said, he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. When you're tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under. So if there's a way out, then there's a reason not to give up. There's a choice to persevere. Right. I mean, it's really, when you look at it like that, and you're like, well, why wouldn't everybody do that? Those qualities of being humble and open-minded and, and thankful, that's where you had to get your heart to see the author of this, this book. If it's not, it's just, you just think it's rules or some old 2,000-year-old book. But when you realize that God is faithful, and he's good. Everything he's wanting is for your good, even though it doesn't seem like it because you, you might have to suffer a bit. No, that's good. <clears throat> and I like that. Um, we're out of time. But uh, I thought in, in our Unashamed Overtime, I want to go back and give you a little bit of flavor from that setting that he was talking about from, from Exodus because there's some interesting stuff in there. So we'll do that in the overtime. We'll pick up 1 Corinthians 10 uh, next time. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.